Hello and welcome to another eMath Instruction Common Core Algebra 1 lesson. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 11, Lesson Number 5 on Step Functions. Let me remind you that you can get a copy of the worksheet that we use in this lesson and a copy of an, a homework that goes along with it by clicking on the video's description. As well, don't forget that on every one of our worksheets there's a nice QR code that you can use a mobile app to scan and bring you right to this video. All right, let's get into it. Step functions um, are functions that stay constant and then step up or down. Uh, before we really get into step functions, what I'd like to do is review horizontal lines or constant functions. So I don't particularly have this problem in the worksheet, but let me give you an example. <clears throat> if we had the function f of x equals 4, it seems like a very strange function because normally if I say, ah, well, what's f of, let's say, 7, I would take 7 and I'd put it in wherever there's an x. But there is no x, so f of 7 is 4, right? Likewise, if I asked what f of 1 would be, it would be 4. If I asked what f of 0 was, it would be 4. And this would give rise to all sorts of points, like, for instance, the point 1, 4, or the point 0, 4 or the point 7, 4, which isn't even on my grid, or the point 2 and a half, 4. So f of x equals 4 is a function that when graphed is simply a horizontal line. So constant functions are very strange because they're rules that say, hey, no matter what the input is, the output is, in this case, 4. All right. Step functions really are going to be comprised of a bunch of different horizontal line segments depending on what the value of x is. Okay, So I'm going to clear out this text and then we're going to move on to the first true step function problem. Let's take a look. Okay, So we're going to start actually with an applied example. Exercise 1 says an electrician works at a job site at a rate of $40 per hour or any portion of an hour. In other words, he will charge you $40 as soon as he comes up to the first hour, and then $40 for the second hour, etc. Letter A says graph the amount the electrician charges in dollars as a function of the number of hours that he works. See, this is kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> take a look at the scale, right? Just to make sure you get it, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 20, 40, 60, 80, 200. So these things are going by 20s. You can always mark that off if you need to. I'm going to mark it just for the first hundred so that we kind of get it. All right. So basically what we're saying is, our, our, obviously, if the electrician doesn't work at all, he, he's not going to be charging us any money. So I'm going to put an open circle there. But for the entire first hour, what's going to happen is he's going to charge us $40. All right. Doesn't matter whether we're at a half an hour or three quarters of an hour or a quarter of an hour he's always going to be charging us $40. Then as soon as we get past one hour, he's going to start to charge us $80. So everywhere between one hour and two hours, the electrician is going to charge us $80, including all the way up to two hours. Remember, open circles mean that the point isn't really there, right? After two hours, he's going to lump on another $40. That's going to get us up to $120. All right, we're going to be paying $120 for every amount of time between two and three hours. Then he's going to lump on another $40. So we're going to be at $160 between three and four hours. And then he's going to lump on another $40 and we're going to be at $200 between four and five hours. You can probably tell why it's called a step function, right? It looks like we could literally step up this function. Okay. Letter B says, how much does he charge for working three and a half hours? Circle the point on your graph to show this answer. This is pretty easy. You know, here's 3.5 hours, right? And he charges 20, 40, 60. $160. There we go. $160, right? 
It almost doesn't seem fair, I'm sure, because he's charging $40 an hour, but we haven't hit four hours yet. Still, this is very common when you talk about contracting rates, um, because a contractor doesn't exactly know necessarily how long it's going to take him or her to finish the job. So for that first hour, you're going to pay a flat fee of $40, and then for the second hour, another $40. So it doesn't rise in a linear sense. It's constant, then jumps up to another constant, jumps up to another constant, etc. I'm going to clear this out. So write down whatever you need to. All right, here it goes. Great. Let's move to the next exercise. Okay, so the first exercise was this nice kind of uh, applied version of a step function. In the second problem, I'm going to give you a step function in function notation, right? What's known as a piecewise function. We'll stay in red for the moment. All right, this is what's known as a piecewise function because it is defined in pieces, right? One piece applies from 0 to 3, but not at the 3. One applies from 3 to 5, but not at the 5. And then one applies from 5 to 10, including both the 5 and the 10. So let's see if we can evaluate some of these function values. In fact, I'd like you to pause the video right now and see if you can do letter A based on what you know about function, notation, and piecewise functions. All right, let's do it. So f of 2.7. All right, remember how we read a piecewise function. We say, all right, well, the input's 2.7. Where does 2.7 fall? Ah, 2.7 falls somewhere between 0 and 3. So the function says that the output is 2 whenever the input is between 0 and 3. Easy enough. 3.5 lies in this range. So f of 3.5, the output would be 5. f of 5, where does 5 lie? Ah, 5 lies in this interval, right? Because of the equality right there. So f of 5 is negative 4. And f of 0, ah, 0 lies in this range, so that's also going to be 2. All right, so it says graph f of x on the grid to the right. Well, what does it really say? It says as x goes from 0 to 3, 1, 2, 3, we should have a constant output of 2, including at 0. Now, everywhere along here, we should have an output equal to 2. But what do we do at x equals 3? Well, we know that at x equals 3, the output's actually 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we we know that should really be there, which means we have to have an open circle there. Can't be a closed circle because then we'd have two points that correspond to the input of x equals 3, then it wouldn't be a function. But from 3, 4, 5, from 3 to 5, we know that we have an output of 5. So all along here, it's just going to be an output of 5, but again, the 5 isn't included. x equals 5 is not included. And then from 5 to 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, we'll have outputs of negative 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. So it'll look something like that. Oh, that is not supposed to be like that. There we go. That's a little bit better. right? One of the keys and one of the trickiest things for students are these open circles. So we almost treat it as if the point 3 comma 2 is on the graph, x equals 3, y equals 2, but we leave an open circle there because the 3 is not included. Okay. The domain and the range. This is a little bit tricky. Remember the domain is the set of all inputs. Now, I can get any input between 0, x equals 0, and x equals 10, right? I can either write that like that, or if I like interval notation, if your teacher's taught you that, I can use this. The range, though, that's a little different, right? The range is the set of outputs. 
But the cool thing about the range in the step function and in many step functions is it's got a finite number of values. In fact, you have to list them. You don't have to necessarily list them in order, but there are only three members of the range, negative four, five, and two. That's it. There are no other outputs to this function. So it's not really possible, eh, well, certainly not desirable, to try to list the range in terms of the way that we did with the domain, because then we get an infinite number of values. The range is just these three. All right. So I'm going to clear out this graph, copy down anything you need to. All right, here it goes. Okay, let's move on to the next problem. Ah, exercise three, another practical problem. A pumping station is draining a reservoir with a set of pumps that drain the water at a rate of 250 gallons per hour. Okay. After five hours, additional pumps are turned on or turning on such that they pump at an overall rate of 600 gallons per hour for the next seven hours. Draw a graph of the pump rate function on the grid provided. All right, so what do we know? Um, so for the first five hours, right, water is pumping at a rate of 250 gallons per hour. Okay, well, here's 250, right? And we know that that's going to go for five hours. All right, there's my five hours. Now, it's a little bit questionable whether or not I should use a closed circle and an open circle here. I think I want a closed circle because it says after five hours, additional pumps are turned on. So right after five hours, additional pumps are turned on and the pump rate goes up to 600. So we're not at 600 right at five hours, but immediately afterwards we are for the next seven hours. So that gets us all the way to 12. All right. Something like that. So there's our step function, right? A nice constant, 250 gallons per hour. And then it steps up to 600 gallons per hour. Letter B. How many total gallons of water are pumped out of the reservoir over the 12-hour period? Show the calculations that lead to your answer. Well, I'd like you to think about this for a second. Figure out the total number of gallons of water that get pumped out of the reservoir. All right, let's do it. Not too bad, right? Because really it's a simple rate problem. We have 250 gallons per hour, and we're gonna pump that out for five hours. Think about how the units work here, right? The hours cancel, and we just have gallons, and we end up with 1,250 gallons. That's just what, just what gets pumped out for the first five hours. Then we go up to 600 gallons per hour for seven hours, and that gives us 4,200 gallons that get pumped out during that time. So in total, we add them together and we get what? 5,450 gallons. That might seem like a lot, but it's probably a pretty big reservoir. 5,450 gallons. Simple enough. Let's keep working on this problem. I'm going to clear out this text. Don't worry, I'm going to reproduce that graph on the next sheet, so we'll still have a good, uh, we'll still have a good picture of it. You ready? Okay, it's going to be gone. Okay. So here I've got that that graph drawn, a little bit in miniature, but it's there. The original problem up here as well. Let's take a look at letter C. The reservoir originally contains 8,250 gallons of water. How much does it contain after five hours if water is only pumped out? Show the work that leads to your answer. All right, well, why don't you try to figure this out? All right, this isn't too bad. What we know, right, we, we had already calculated this. For the first five hours, we had that 250 gallons per hour that was being pumped out times five hours. 
And what that gave us was 1,250 gallons that got pumped out. So if we want to know how much it contains after five hours, we'll take what we started with, subtract off what got pumped out, and that means that we've got 7,000 gallons still in there after five hours. <clears throat> Letter D. Engineers want to turn off the pumps when the reservoir reaches a level of 2,000 gallons. Will they need to turn off the pumps during the 12-hour time period? Show evidence to support your yes-no answer. All right, well, play around with this. See, see if they're going to have to turn off the pumps. All right, well, let's take a look. A good way to do this is to simply figure out how much water would be left in there after 12 hours. Well, keep in mind, right after five hours, we've got 7,000 gallons. Um, we do know that we pumped out 600 gallons per hour for that other seven hours, right? And that gave us 4,200 gallons. So I could take that 7,000 gallons, subtract off the 4,200, right? And I end up getting 2,800 gallons left at 12 hours. Well, that's above the 2,000 gallons, right? So the answer to the question is no, right? I never hit the 2,000 gallon mark. All right, last question. Assuming engineers do not turn off any pumps how many total hours will it take to the nearest tenth of an hour to drain the reservoir of all its water? All right, spend a little bit of time and see if you can figure out the answer to this question. But I want the total amount of time. All right, well, we know that after 12 hours, right? So after 12 hours, there's still how much? 2,800 gallons left. So we have to figure out how long it's going to take to empty that. Well, one way to do that is think about it this way, right? We're pumping it at 600 gallons per hour. Maybe multiply by the number of hours and see how long that takes to hit 2,800. Of course, I can easily solve this equation by dividing both sides by 600. And I'll get H equals 4.6 repeated hours. All right, now that's not my total time. That's just how much time after the 12 hours. So my total will be 12 plus 4.6 repeated or 16.6 repeated. So how about 16.7 hours? All right, that's it. Okay, so a little bit of work with rate, a little bit of work with step functions in that problem. I'm going to clear out this text and then we'll wrap up the lesson. Here we go. All right, so step functions aren't too bad if you understand constant functions. The difference between step functions and constant functions are that step functions remain constant for a certain interval of time or for a certain interval along the x-axis, then they step up to another constant value for a certain amount of time, a certain distance along the x-axis, then they step to another constant value for a while, etc. All right. Your real task is to interpret, you know, what intervals and what constants are in the function. Okay. Well, until next time, let me remind you that this is another eMath Instruction Common Core Algebra 1 lesson. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.